we now have a different incentive mechanism. And it's interesting to see companies out in Africa cooperating. Like I think the Bitcoin system just has different incentives. You've got companies cooperating and because everything's open and it's one standard, it's very, very different from the monopolist kind of capitalist structures we've had in the past that trend towards monopolization and rent seeking and exploitation. This is a system that trends potentially towards cooperation and lowering the cost for people. So I think that that's my biggest takeaway this year is I've started to sort of notice this incentive design of Bitcoin, like maybe really, really paying off in terms of empowering communities and, and maybe even nations in the future. Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. The Breakdown is sponsored by Nexo.io, Circle, and Kraken, and produced and distributed by Coindesk. What's going on, guys? It is Saturday, December 31st, the last day of the year. And today, we are closing out our end-of-year interview series with Alex Gladstein. Before we get into that, if you are enjoying The Breakdown, please go subscribe to it, give it a rating, give it a review, or if you want to dive deeper into the conversation, come join us on The Breakers Discord. You can find the link in the show notes or go to bit.ly slash breakdown pod. All right, guys. Well, for many of you, Alex Gladstein needs no introduction. He's the chief strategy officer at the Human Rights Foundations and one of the clarion voices helping Bitcoiners understand, see, and experience how Bitcoin is impacting communities around the world, especially those who are living inside unstable monetary regimes or under autocratic power. It was another amazing year of Alex's writing and contributing to our understanding of Bitcoin. And in this conversation, we talk about his experience at the Africa Bitcoin Conference, his recent time in India, and why so much of the energy around Bitcoin is coming from emerging markets and the developing world. All right, Alex, welcome back to The Breakdown, sir. How are you doing? Great. Happy to be here. Happy holidays. You too. You too. Um, listen, I, I'm always excited to chat with you. Uh, and I think this year is a particularly opportune time to um, reflect on the year that was uh, in Bitcoin in particular. And, uh, you know, you obviously have been out there kind of living, exploring and, and discovering uh, Bitcoin and all of its various manifestations. So I'm really excited to chat. And, you know, by way of starting really, really broad, um, if you had to summarize Bitcoin's year in 2022, what would you say? Well, for me, it was global adoption. And I think that continues in 2023. I've seen stuff that, uh, you know, that you people wouldn't believe. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's true. Uh, um, especially when I went down to um, the Africa Bitcoin Conference in Ghana, uh, just uh, staggered by the variety of communities and uh, businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators and developers building on Bitcoin and focusing on Bitcoin from countries that like most Americans don't even know exist. I mean, it's really just incredible um, meeting people from Somaliland and Benin and Cameroon and DR Congo and, you know, people coming to this conference and then going home to cities like Mogadishu where they're going to continue to work on their projects was pretty mind blowing. I mean, it's safe to say that in all the world's most like crazy conflict zones and dictatorships, um, <clears throat> there are thriving Bitcoin communities. And I just, that I think that speaks so strongly about what Bitcoin is, um, that it's just this tool that people can use even when everything else around them collapses. And I guess that couldn't be any further from the narrative in the mainstream media, which is that Bitcoin and crypto, quote unquote, are this like malignant, cancerous thing that must be destroyed and rooted out and they've ruined all these people's lives. So it's it's amazing to actually go see the, uh, get the signal because there's a lot of noise. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I wanted to dig, this was great because I wanted to dig more in with you uh, around the conference because I haven't chatted with you since you got back from that. And and you, you could almost feel, for those of you who kind of pay attention to your content and your tweets and things like that, you could feel that sort of excitement emanating from you. You know, I think you would go into anything like that with, with uh, optimism and enthusiasm, but it felt sort of differentiatedly so. So I'd love to hear more about some of the specific types of things that you saw. You know, how much was this, uh, you know, 
entrepreneurs building sort of new technology that helped expend uh, and extend sort of the utility of Bitcoin versus people who are just sort of solving problems around local application and use of Bitcoin for their own communities? Yeah, well, I think there's a surprising amount of both in that case, let's say African builders, and maybe that's a proxy for Latin American builders and builders from Southeast Asia, from South Asia, from the Middle East, like they're like, you know, part of this big global community. So they're like, in many ways, they're reading the same news and listening to the same podcasts as Bitcoiners in America, in the United States and in Europe, um, which makes this kind of really neat kind of global uh, construct. But at the same time, they're doing stuff that like we are just clueless about. Uh, you know, I met a guy there whose team has made it possible for people to use Bitcoin without internet, without data, uh, using uh, a text message protocol called USSD, which is very popular in Africa. So basically you can have like a candy bar phone or like an old phone or, or even, you know, a lot of people have feature phones in Africa or smartphones in Africa that, that just, but the data is too expensive. So um, a lot of folks out there who have the power to call and text, and that's how they do their banking in many cases through mobile money already, right? And now they can just like text a number and it spits out on their phone like a menu of options and, and it allows them to like move Bitcoin around and, and it's over done over the lightning network. And I thought that, that was like kind of mind blowing. Now it's it's kind of early days for that stuff, but I think it's going to rapidly develop and, and grow. I also met a lot of people just building businesses around the blazingly obvious use case that it's very hard to send money into Africa and within Africa you have 41 central banks. You have a lot of restrictions on money coming into Africa. The whole banking system there is colonial, is still colonial, um, and was created by colonialists, by foreign powers, for the express purpose of intermediating payments. Instead of making them easy or connecting people, it was to divide and to extract rent. That's like how the whole financial system there was built. Um, so you have some absurd percentage of value of fees when you send money from one African country to another going to European or American companies. It's crazy. So when you have that world around you and you have it so difficult to send money to places like Somalia or DR Congo from family and friends or clients in Europe or Asia or the United States, um, you start to really see the obvious use case for Bitcoin and, and for stable coins, let's say. So you meet a lot of people who've created businesses around you know, receiving the Bitcoin or the stable coins and then being like the off ramp into local fiat or whatever. Um, that's huge. So that's a massively ballooning business. I think you're only going to see that get bigger and bigger. Um, whether it be in Nigeria or yeah, I mean, some of these, um, you know, smaller countries, but, but countries with that, that may have big use cases. Like I met this entrepreneur from Somalia and he's got 30,000 clients and he's, you know, average, average amount of value for each remittance for these clients is 50 to hundred bucks. And they come in, in Bitcoin or, or stable coin. And, and he, he helps convert that for them. Right. And uh, yeah, they, they could do P2P if they wanted to. And we're certainly out there to try and encourage these circular P2P economies. But, you know, for a lot of folks, you know, they're, look, they're still in the fiat system. And I just think it's interesting that Bitcoin actually improves the fiat system in many ways in, in some of these places like this uh, product that was launched there, um, and it's something that a, a Nigerian entrepreneur named Bernard Para created, where he has an integration with M-Pesa that allows American or European entrepreneurs, like let's say Jack Mahlers, who announced a partnership on stage there with Bernard, which allows any strike user in the United States to instantly settle money into any M-Pesa user's uh, mobile money wallet in Kenya. Like that's amazing. So that's the kind of stuff you're starting to see is like people starting to, understand and take advantage of Bitcoin's like incredible utility as a cross-border payment tool um, and Lightning Network being like a really key part of that. It's just, you start seeing how it connects different fiat pools, which are otherwise separated from each other with bureaucracy or rent seeking or exploitative companies or whatever. We can just brush all that nonsense aside and we could just connect directly with an asset that is 24 seven liquid and instantly travels and isn't somebody's liability. I think that's super, super, super powerful. So seeing a lot of that, seeing a lot of innovation and then seeing a lot of communities. I mean, I saw, I met a guy who we actually just announced support for today. His thing's called Bitcoin Mountain. He's in uh, Cameroon, a country in central West Africa 
on an enormous volcano called Mount Cameroon. Um, there's been a lot of conflict in that area. This is a country racked by strife between the English and the French speaking communities of that country that dates back to all kinds of colonial nonsense. Um, and a lot of people in his area have fled. There's a lot of displacement, but he's built, he's staying there to build a Bitcoin community based around uh, education about Bitcoin and entrepreneurship and things like that. So I was very inspired by that. And and you just see a lot of that. I mean, there's Bitcoin communities in Eastern Congo. There's, you know, communities in uh, Ethiopia all over. So um, again, just, just really impressed and uh, stunned by the impact that Bitcoin's having uh, in Africa for sure. So obviously you kind of you walk through sort of the technologies and use cases and how they are similar or different than you know what we might see uh, in sort of developed countries uh, in in the U.S. or in Europe or something like that. But how much do you think these sort of narratives, the community conversations, the discussion points around Bitcoin, how similar or different are they in those communities as opposed to you know your average conversation on Bitcoin Twitter, for example? Sure, and I, I also went to India the month before. And I think that's another really important place for Bitcoin. I mean, it's going to—it's basically the world's largest country. It's about tied with China, but it has a, a higher growth rate. Uh, I mean, I think Indians are going to be the best Bitcoiners. I think Indians are going to really build out uh, over the next decade plus a, a epicenter of Bitcoin because they are suspect of government programs, number one. They like cash, number two, and they love gold, number three. So they're kind of just like sort of perfectly set up to become Bitcoiners. Uh, I think that what you see there, though, also similarly in Africa is like just so many scams and so much nonsense and so much hype that the actual hard work of, of building out the Bitcoin communities is is yeoman's work. I mean, it's brick by brick. It's like teaching one by one. It's teaching people about the value of this thing and teaching them about what money is and uh, teaching them about how we can have a better world in both places. Like you're seeing the hard work being done in, in a slow but steady way. Um, and it is easy to get distracted by the siren call of all this like token creation and issuance. And, you know, those companies are going to have marketing budgets to go into these universities in Lagos and in Bengaluru uh, and to recruit students to work on their token projects. The same thing happens at Stanford, by the way, and at Berkeley and all these universities in the United States and, and in Europe. But that's just part of the journey. Like you're going to have the siren call of that easy money, like get rich quick. And overwhelmingly, that was not what I encountered. The people that I met with are not interested in getting rich quick. They are interested in building long-term generational wealth for their communities and for their nations. Um, they are not interested in making trade-offs. Um, they are interested in ground-up education with grassroots communities, uh, getting men and women and girls and boys from different backgrounds and religions uh, involved in this thing. And they're not going to stop and they're going to be very persistent. Um, I do think that they take a lot of solace and uh, inspiration when they get shout outs and when they get acknowledged by kind of more prominent Bitcoin personalities, let's say in the West. Um, for example, Jack Dorsey being there at the Ghana conference was amazing. I mean, he spent three days there. He was very involved. He was very present. He was front row in the, the seats. Like he was listening to everything. He was much more a, a listener than a, a speaker. Um, and he deserves such enormous credit for that. And he brought a big team from Block and they were all there learning and, and really just kind of diving in with the community. And that that is such a such a rich thing to do. Like that that's going to provide so much like information and education for his company and for the builders at Block. That um that they need a lot of uh of praise for doing that. And Strike did the same thing. Strike brought a whole bunch of people. Paxful was there. There were quite a few companies um, created by you know American founders that that were there in spades. And I think that's that's very important. Is you just got to get out there and. and learn about what's happening there. And that, that helps you, I think, kind of put everything in context. Uh, so, so important. In an ecosystem where innovation is the norm, it's the basics that are in the spotlight. Nexo is a company that has never put the safety of clients' funds in question. With over 50 global licenses, $775 million in insurance, and a real-time audit of custodial assets, Nexo sets an example for security standards in the industry. Apart from keeping their 5 million clients safe, Nexo has kept building. They've just announced their non-custodial smart wallet. Visit nexo.io, that's N-E-X-O and sign up today.
This episode is brought to you by Circle, the sole issuer of USDC and a leader in crypto that's held to a higher standard. USDC is a fast, safe, and efficient way to send money around the globe. USDC is always redeemable one-to-one for US dollars and has over $45 billion in circulation as of October 13th, 2022. Plus, Circle posts weekly reserve reports and monthly attestations of reserve capital, letting users know that USDC is safe, transparent, and compliant with regulations. Just go to circle.com backslash transparency to see why USDC is a trusted stablecoin. As one of the largest, longest lasting, and most secure exchanges, Kraken sets the example for transparency and trust while delivering on their mission to empower people with new ways to connect and transact. Millions of people around the world count on the Kraken mobile app as the easiest, safest, and most flexible way to start building their crypto portfolio. Kraken's industry-leading security keeps your funds and information safe, and their award-winning client engagement teams are available for support 24-7. Download the Kraken app on Google Play or the Apple App Store, or visit kraken.com slash breakdown to join. So India is one of the places where there's the most fluid and large conversation or large scale conversation about a CBDC, right? The Reserve Bank of India is very against crypto. It's explicit that its CBDC is um, an attempt to take the the best of crypto and and do it in such a way that people don't have to deal with crypto. Is how how much does that color kind of the experience of that community there? And maybe same question for Nigeria and other places where CBDCs are relatively advanced. So Nigeria is, again, uh, noteworthy, largest country in Africa. It's going to be the third largest country in the world in a few decades. People call it like the United States of Africa. It's it's an incredible place. And uh, I think that um, there you have a government that's also pushing a CBDC really hard and that, that has, has gone to great lengths to try and restrict its population from using Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So, for example, they've really tried to like cut off the banking sector's connection to, to cryptocurrency exchanges. So that they've really tried to sever those on-ramps and off-ramps. So everything in Nigeria is basically done on P2P markets now. And I, I think that shows the resilience of this thing um, in many cases. Um, but it also shows you that you're going to have hostile governments that are going to try to go after uh, sort of non-governmental uh, digital currencies. Same thing in India. I, I would note that the Bitcoin community in Nigeria is much bigger than the Bitcoin community in India. Bitcoin community in India is very small. It's, it's growing, you know, I think it's growing quickly, but it's like, it's, it's starting from a small place. Uh, I think there is a massive crypto community in India, but much more focused on trading tokens. There's not a big crypto, a Bitcoin community there rather. So interesting to see that. So I think they need a lot of support. In Nigeria though, it's like pretty significant. Like I was sitting in a room in Ghana, I was doing a workshop. There were about 35 people in the room and 20 of them were Bitcoin and, or Lightning engineers from Lagos. And I'm like, wow, like there must be more Bitcoin engineers in Lagos than San Francisco at this point. It's pretty amazing. So, and that's due to a lot of hard work by fellowship programs like Kala, QALA and others who, who are, you know, churning out Bitcoin devs um, and, and getting them placed with companies. I think Kala had about a dozen people in their last cohort and hundred percent of them got placed with Bitcoin companies. So I think you're seeing a lot of that. I think uh, Jay-Z and Jack Dorsey's B-Trust initiative is going to go a long way towards supercharging that, not just in Africa, but also in India and Latin America and other parts of the world. So very excited to see that happening. Um, But yeah, in general, these Bitcoin communities are, they're a little smaller, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't underestimate them. And I think one of the big things you learn from being out there is just how massive Binance is. I mean, Binance is like the the absolute... um, elephant in in these places like it it dominates financial services uh through the like sort of binance tether stack i mean i think you have in some countries a much larger exposure than than bitcoin for example so like in nigeria tether on binance is probably traded at much higher volumes um, by many more people than than bitcoin is um other countries it's not so much the case but certainly in nigeria that's the case turkey that's the case um, so you see a lot of reliance on Binance and on Tether, and um, that worries me. I mean, I think I want to give credit to this company and to this product because they've provided financial services where the legacy system has failed across the emerging markets. But like, I don't think necessarily that their intentions are good, especially in the Binance case. Like, they're self-interested. They want to like colonize and take over these places. So I'm a little worried that there's so much reliance on these two things. 
So the more we can get people learning more about Bitcoin and self-custody, I think that's going to be uh, better and better and better. Um, but wow, is it amazing to see like what, what kind of footprint they have and certainly Tether. I mean, wow. I mean, this thing is a humanitarian tool right now. I mean, it's, it's inarguable. This is a, I mean, I feel like it's actually, we probably catch up, you know, on the show once every six months or so. And, and one of the things that we could almost just track over time is this discussion of where sort of dollarized assets fit relative to Bitcoin in terms of both global adoption sort of of Bitcoin, but more broadly just of people actually being able to solve their problems with better financial tools sort of from a, from this ecosystem. So it's interesting to kind of hear hear that update from the ground there. I mean, it's Yeah, but of course, I mean, they, they exist at the pleasure of the U.S. government, right? So USDC and Tether and, you know, BUSD, let's say, which is a Paxos created thing. I mean, these are, these are virtual dollars that are really cool because people in Lebanon, for example, or in Nigeria can hold a dollar on their phone without a U.S. bank account or an ID. Like, that's very powerful. But let's not, you know, fool ourselves here. They exist at the pleasure of the U.S. government. They're ephemeral. They are temporary. They are short-term fixes. Um, Long-term, you know, I, I think we got to be investing and in moving to this, like, global Bitcoin economy. That's that's on a solid foundation. Like these things are um, very risky in that sense. Um, like they need to be credited for the fact that they've helped so many people in the last few years. Uh, but man, they could go away in an instant. How much do you see people sort of being aware of that fact? And, and you know, I, I've I've seen or encountered some number, not necessarily the mainstream, but some number of people who have a pretty clear sense of what Bitcoin is sort of useful for in their lived context, but also who are in a dollarized ecosystem, right? In Argentina, for example. And so, you know, put play that game because that's the game that is to be played. And that's the what allows them to interface. I mean, people don't have the luxury necessarily of thinking about like the like the risk of tether, right? Collapsing. That's like they just need dollars. So and oftentimes that's ruinous, right? People are going to learn their lesson, right? So apparently, from what my friends told me in Argentina, for example, people were like skeptical of Tether. So they were using uh, Terra. They were using UST and they all lost everything. So um, like quite a few uh, lower to middle class people in Argentina and Turkey and these other countries, these large, large countries with tens or hundreds of millions of people, you know, they were using UST because they didn't trust Tether for whatever reason. Um, or, or it was the cheapest thing they could get or whatever. Well, they all lost everything. So, you know, I think you, you learn over time. Um, and, you know, over time, people are going to learn more about self-custodying Bitcoin as, as like an important thing for them and their family and their business. Um, but that's, that's just something that takes a long, long time. Like for now, Tether and stable coins are playing a huge role in the emerging markets and th- this needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. H- how discordant has it been over the last couple of months for you to be in these contexts, watching people sort of solving problems that matter to them in their real life with Bitcoin, while watching simultaneously the sort of implosion of FTX, the larger ecosystem that falls with it. I mean, it must be almost like mentally fragging in some ways. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you know, you've got the mainstream media calling Bitcoin dead again, people associating Bitcoin with FTX, saying it's all a scam. People who know better actually, you know, Man, a lot of these people, they're feeling really good right now because uh, it's sort of, they feel like their thesis has been vindicated. They feel like FTX collapsing means that Bitcoin isn't working. And man, how it's just incredible how wrong they are. Like, just, just to focus on that one use case of moving money from the United States to Nigeria, it's not just that it's faster and easier uh, to do it over a Bitcoin rail and a lightning rail. And, and cheaper in that regard. Like, think about the fact that when you do it this way, you get exposed to the black market or the street rate of exchange versus the official rate. So in a country like Nigeria, you're talking about getting 600 something Naira to the dollar instead of 400 something. So if you use an official product, the government is going to steal and, and essentially steal and, and only give you the official rate of exchange. Same thing is happening in Cuba and all these other places. So if you use like an official way of moving money from one country to another, all these bureaucrats and thieves take uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% in some cases of the value and your family or your, your clients get like, you know, whatever, a small percentage, um, n- not due to any sort of technical inefficiency, 
but due to the, the control over the monetary system and the control over the rate of exchange. So when you're trading uh, Bitcoin between different fiats, uh, you get the real price uh, of, of, the, of the fiat in that country. And this alone is so, so important and yet is completely either, un- usually probably, you know, to be fair, like people don't know this, like they're just ignorant about it. Um, but in some cases, like you've got people who are just so doubled down on their position that Bitcoin and all cryptocurrency is useless that they, they'll, they'll be willingly blind to this, actually. It's kind of amazing. I think that in some ways, at this point, saying that Bitcoin has no use case is tantamount to admitting that you do not care about the developing world, you know what I mean, or emerging markets. Like, like it really, I mean, it really is on some level. It's, if you're saying you could, with a straight face, say, I guess, maybe, that, uh, no, I can't even justify it. Anyways, the point is just, you know what I'm going No, with. and like the people that I've been going back and forth with, with years, most, most of the smart ones have at least acknowledged that, yeah, they're like, fine, in some cases, sure, okay, fine. Right, in, the, in these other contexts that aren't you here in the US. Right, but then what happens when those cases come home to roost? Like what happens in the United States or Europe, you have high inflation, or what happens in these places where all of a sudden, maybe you get deplatformed, or all of a sudden, your fundraiser gets shut down, like we saw happen in, in Canada. Um, you know, or what happens when you do something that really, you know, provokes the people in charge, like look at WikiLeaks did. I mean, the, the use case remains the same as it was in 2011. I mean, bank accounts get shut down by the government, you can use Bitcoin, right? That, that <laughs> remains the same as it was with WikiLeaks, like remains the same today. I mean, I just don't even know where to begin with these people. Like, it's almost like they forgot the whole thing with Ukraine and how many people were helped by this technology when Russia invaded Ukraine. That's gone out the window. They forgot about that. They forgot about Venezuela, they've, they've forgotten about all these cross-border payment things. They're willing to throw all this out because they now see that like, oh, FTX was a scammer. And by the way, it's like, of course he was a scammer. Like every Bitcoiner knew that he was a scammer, or at least most Bitcoiners did. Um, the guy was anti-proof of work. He was trashing Lightning Network and all this stuff. And it was kind of plain to see what he was what he was interested in. And um, the media just laid it on thick with him until the day he collapsed. It's like, okay. Okay, you've been critical. You've been critical about SBF since the collapse. Who cares? I want to see what you were saying six months ago. That tells me more about like kind of how I can trust you. And most of these platforms um, were were knighting him as some sort of you know new JP Morgan is completely ridiculous. So we'll see. I think I think that like how people in the crypto industry talk about Bitcoin and how they support Bitcoin continues to be a massive way to determine their authenticity. Like you have people who run crypto businesses with tons of tokens who treat Bitcoin seriously, like Jesse, you know, at Kraken, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and that helps you differentiate them from people who don't. People like S- clowns like SBF who, at, who were in back and forths with Bitcoiners year, a year ago, two years ago about proof of work and about lightning. And he went out there and said that Bitcoin would never be used for payments. That was on the front page of the FT. This was like a year ago. And we were all like, who is this clown? Like, what, how is this even possible? So, of course, no, like we didn't know that he was perpetrating like this much like theft. And we didn't know like how many billions of dollars of of tokens he had over at Alameda that he was just like sort of gambling away with customer deposits. And we didn't know that he had five hundred million dollars of basically customer deposits deployed into VC stuff like these things weren't known. But like there were plenty of red flags. Right. But, you know, we'll see what happens in the next cycle. But I do think that like it's relatively easy to see in the wider crypto space who should be taken seriously based on how how they treat Bitcoin and how open minded they are about it. So um, I think that's a nice little way to like kind of uh, put our hat on as we move forward into 2023. We can kind of like parse what these actors are saying and, you know, how open they are to what's happening in Bitcoin. And God, in the in the no coiner land, it's like these folks are just so clueless. I mean, people that I've had actual debates with, um, I mean, on your show, even who are smart people are are now just saying they're reverting that they admitted that Bitcoin had a use case. And now they're saying it doesn't. And man, I'm not going to name names, but these are some famous people who have lots of followers who are now just like back to their old prop of this thing's like bad and, and useless. And man, it's amazing to watch this happen. I actually think back to that conversation uh, holding aside who, who you're speaking of, but so you had a conversation with Ben Hunt on this show oh, right, in yeah. late, late 2020. And I actually think about it quite frequently because it was a long conversation. 
Yeah. It was a good faith conversation. Neither of you guys came in with sort of claws out or anything like that. And really what it came down to, if you re- if you sum up the entire, like, I don't know, however long it was, hour, hour and a half, two hours, it came down to Ben saying, if Wall Street gets its dirty little paws on this thing, <laughs> it's useless. And you say, yeah. no, it isn't. <laughs> like, that's, that's just factually not true. You could never get over that impasse because the context that you were coming from is like, do those people playing their financial games with Bitcoin make it useless to all of the people that you just experienced in Ghana, uh, you know, who from all over the continent? And he, his answer was yes. Yeah, well, his, he's not here to defend his piece, so I won't go into that. But the point is that like, it was amazing to think about those debates that we have over here, which are kind of like these very sheltered debates, which are about a thing that neither Ben nor I rely on to survive, right? Or that we need to interact with the wider world. And then I, I just transpose that or, or I compare that to what I saw in, in India or in Africa. And I'm just like, man, we're living in two different worlds. That's exactly the point that I want to make. I didn't want to kind of put Ben on blast in terms of his point. It's more just the fact of what you saw as this was happening, as he was and other people like him were remaking those points, I think is sort of just the contradiction right there. Well, and this is a larger point about the world, and the world is split into two, the haves and the have-nots. You've got the golden billion who live in Europe and the United States and Japan and its allies, and they enjoy like a more stable financial world, and they enjoy a better kind of like uh, arrangement of uh, productivity of labor and, and of manufacture of goods. And this is just sort of the dominance of the world today, like some countries just benefit from the system and the vast majority of people suffer in the system. You know, they, they are on the other end of that. And this is a system enforced by, you know, groups like the IMF and the World Bank. And um, you have powers that be and you have everybody else. And for everybody else, Bitcoin's really exciting because it gives them a way to communicate without benefiting the powers that be. And it gives them a way to do commerce and to transact with each other in a way that doesn't ask for permission from those powers that be, or that doesn't somehow uh, benefit them. Like all of the existing banking systems in the world exist to benefit the powers that be. That's literally how they're built up and how they're designed. Uh, You've got all these countries borrowing and basically paying over time money to these banks that loan to them in the West. You know, those banks are making money off these poor countries. Um, And again, in countries like Africa, you can see in the payment systems, they're making money off the fact that it's like very expensive for Africans to transact with one another across borders, um, Latin Americans, Southeast Asians, etc. So the world is very unjust in the way that it's structured currently, at least from a financial, economic, political point of view. Um, And Bitcoin is is really growing in in the areas where people have, have a tougher time. And I don't know if Satoshi could have predicted that one. I mean, it's kind of amazing, but, uh, you know, I think they predicted a lot of things, but I I don't think they predicted that. And I don't think they predicted this other thing, which is so incredible that's happening, especially in Africa, is that the way that people are going to be able to monetize stranded energy uh, and turn it into Bitcoin for economic activity is just remarkable. Like, I love seeing what's happening with Gridless, um, this company out in, in East Africa, they're helping electrify villages that have hydro with micro hydro. This is something a block and still Mark invested in recently. There was a big round. Um, Eric Herzman, who's helping lead that effort, is like just an awesome person and really sees the benefit here in helping communities get cheaper energy. What's so cool about this is it doesn't require like a government subsidy. There's not like it doesn't require taxpayer money to like fix this problem. People are bringing their own capital from elsewhere to come into these villages to set up these mines. Because they're making money too. But guess what? It means cheaper electricity for the village. And that's like the whole incentive mechanism of Bitcoin, both in the energy market and in the financial market. It's so interesting. Like, it, I just think it has different incentives. I think it's fair to say that the current world, wherever you stand, is broken. The incentives suck. Uh, even if you're pro capitalist, you have to acknowledge that, like, quote unquote, capitalism is wreaking havoc in the global south. Like, this is just what it does, right? And maybe you want to say, well, it's not real capitalism. Well, fine, that's fine. But the reality is that we now have a different incentive mechanism. And it's interesting to see companies out in Africa cooperating. Like, I think the Bitcoin system just has different incentives. Like, it's you've got companies cooperating. And because everything's open and it's one, one standard, it's very, very different from the monopolist kind of capitalist structures we've had in the past that, that trend towards monopolization and rent seeking and exploitation. Like, this is a system that trends potentially towards cooperation and lowering the cost for people. 
So I think that that's uh, my biggest takeaway this year is I've started to sort of notice this uh, incentive, a design of Bitcoin, like maybe really, really paying off in terms of uh, empowering communities and, and maybe even nations in the future. That's a pretty good, pretty good note to end on. But I think for the sake of, uh, of consistency, I'll ask you one, one more question, uh, which is just what does a successful 2023 look like for Bitcoin? Yeah, well, I think um, more global adoption, more, more growth. I think that if you saw more developers contributing from Southeast Asia and South Asia and Middle East and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Latin America, more events, more conferences, more Bitcoin meetups, more communities, uh, more products coming out of these places. I mean, that's really going to be, you know, what, what determines whether it's a successful year. And I, I think that we're really well set up for that. Um, and I think that anybody in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency that's not paying attention to these trends owes themselves a pilgrimage to going to one of these Bitcoin conferences in these countries and seeing for themselves like what what's actually happening. Like it, it will, even if you're jaded and knowledgeable about the industry, I think even the most jaded or bullish, but you know, whether you're bullish or bearish doesn't matter, but even the most knowledgeable industry participant who's been in crypto for 10 years or who's been studying it from the desk of a financial services company and been thinking about how, how do we introduce this to my colleagues? Like for anybody in that sort of situation, you really owe it to yourself to going to one of these events next year and getting out there and seeing what people are doing with this thing. It is very inspiring and energizing. And, and I think that's where I stand today is just extremely energized from what I saw. So um, really, really looking forward to 2023. Amazing. Oh, Alex, always great to have you on. I think uh, your level of energy relative to the average guest on these end of your shows, I think tells the probably listeners all they need to know about. <laughs> Fired the, up, uh, man. Let's the, go. Yeah, the, the excitement <laughs> versus uh, so, the other thing. so great to have you as always and uh, look forward to our next catch up. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me on. All right, guys, back to NLW. Now, if you've listened to all of these interviews, this is not a group of sad sacks who are wallowing in whatever the problems of this year were. It's all people who are looking forward, who are firmly pointed straight ahead. But I still think there's something so clear in Alex's energy compared to everyone that I've spoken with that is just so different. We talked about it on the show, but I really do think of what the contrast must have been being at the Africa Bitcoin conference, seeing all of these people who are using Bitcoin in real ways in their real lives to benefit themselves, their families, and their communities, even as all this bullshit with SBF and FTX are transpiring. It could not be more discordant, and it could not be a more clear reminder of what really matters as we close out 2022 and head into the new year. Certainly, if nothing else, it's a reminder for me of what got me excited about this space in the first place. And I'm so excited for a chance to have more conversations like that one, as well as with the people that Alex was meeting with directly. I'm incredibly appreciative of all of my sponsors, of my supporters, of my listeners throughout this year, and I can't wait to get to 2023. So one last time for 2022, until tomorrow, be safe and take care of each other. Peace. Peace.